paying attention to how to create value for others if you're in business is a really good step. It's a different perspective, and it's one that will not be comfortable or easy, but it will not harm or damage. There's only upside in doing that. It's time for CX Education. Welcome to the podcast for enterprise CX professionals, the people who want to connect with customers on their own terms, before, during, and after a purchase is made. In each episode, you'll learn how to create experiences your customers love. Ready? Here we go. Welcome to another episode of CX Education, and I'm Heather Sheriff. This is an episode brought to you by Cinch, a platform that enables you to create mobile experiences, your whole customers will love, and by also connecting you with your audience on their own terms, when and how they want. So today I have a really great guest with us, Mike Wittenstein from Story Miners, and we both share uh, the same town. We're both in the Atlanta area, so it was nice to really meet somebody that's kind of in my own backyard. And I want to go ahead and get going and, you know, dive in a little bit about what you do. And if maybe you can tell me a little bit about your background and how you got to this business called Story Miners. Sure, sure. Well, you know, like everybody else, you really only get to make two decisions in life, what you learn and who you hang out with. Everybody, everything else is kind of determined for you. Sometimes you get to pick where to live. So I made some really interesting choices along the way that gave me the opportunity to learn foreign languages and cultures, to see people by walking in their shoes. So I got that skill to start a business when I was very, very young, like in my early teens. I've also had the opportunity to learn from some amazing folks, just like everybody else. But when you recognize that you're learning from amazing folks, it makes a difference because sometimes you can just like skate right by and miss some really good stuff. What got me into customer experience was a couple of things. The first one was my uncle, Sam. He was a vaudeville producer before he became a real estate agent and insurance guy and ran a travel agency. After college, I didn't know what to do. So I went to work in the family, in the family business and learned quite a bit about travel. But the thing that I take with me until today, that was just, he taught me so well is the value of actually creating an experience that your customers can be part of, that they can actually go inside of. So his very small travel agency in Derby, Connecticut was nondescript. It looked like any other store down the street. But as soon as you walk in and you look to the left, there was a little French chalet. And if you look a little farther down, there's like a Swiss Alps mountain village. And over here, there was like an Italian piazza with uh, big opening doors and red and white tablecloths ready to to serve you a meal. And his office was a uh, retooled leather from a, a ship's captain's berth. So he had all the insides wow. taken out and put in his office. So no matter where you went, you felt like you were on vacation. And when you walk up to the front counter, it was actually made of an airplane wing. So very tastefully done most of the time. And it was just so amazing as I was learning to sell from him and learning the travel business and you know, this is like almost pre-computers. How do you get people to imagine that they're working with the product or service that you have for sale? But it was so easy to do that with my Uncle Sam. So he was a big influencer on me for customer service. And I grew up in the Orlando, Florida area. So as Disney was buying up 27,000 acres of land under everyone's noses without knowing it, they eventually opened in 1971. So a cousin of mine ran the jewelry stores at Disney World, and my sister was a character and a guide, and other people had other, all kinds of other jobs. And I started hearing all kinds of things about Disney, which influenced me a lot too. One of them was that you go on stage, you don't go to work. When they're training you, you are in costume, and you must stay in the story. So if you've got, you know, future to, or tomorrow land clothes on that are supposed to be cleanly pressed. I mean, you need to stand at attention. And if you're wearing boots in, you know, frontier land, you know, it's, it's, uh, your gait is a little bit different. Your clothes are different. All the clues kind of line up. So those are my first two experiences with experience. And then uh, after graduate in graduate school, I picked a direction to go called services marketing over product marketing. Mm-hmm. And that taught me so much about not just pushing 
the size of the package and the coloring and the labels and all those things and which way do the cereal box flaps go. It taught me about how people like to work with companies because you can't have a service unless the customer's part of it. You can have a product, you know, without having anything to do with it, but it's a service. You kind of have to be there at the same time that you consume it. And it changes the dynamics. It also changes the palette that you get to work with as an artist. You know, if you're, if you're a designer or a strategist, now you get to work with all kinds of things that you couldn't before. You're not limited to cardboard, you know, paper and, and ink. You can work with architecture, behaviors, technology, projection, carpets, furniture, just everything becomes part of what you do. So long, this is too long of a story. I was going to say long story no, short, no. but oh my gosh, it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, ac it's actually very fascinating because not to interrupt you, but I'm already thinking about just things that it's interesting to know how something from so long ago stuck with you, right? And then you were able to look at that and go, God, I really remember that. And that really meant something to me, right? Yeah. And, ago. you know, when it happened, I didn't know that. So yeah, just as you're walking around, whoever's listening, as you're walking around in the world, leave your recorder on. You never know what you're going to come across that you're going to need later. Very helpful. So I'm actually going to ask you a question about that before we jump into a little more meat. So you said at Disney, you had to stay in the story. So I would love to maybe come back to that as we talk about businesses and things they can do, because how would, a, you know, and we don't have to get into this right now, but like, how would a business get their folks to stay in the story? Like, what does that mean? So think about that. And as we kind of learn a little bit more about the tips and the things that you can provide our audience today. I think that would be something interesting for them, right? Like how long? That's so kind of you to give me a heads up and let me think about it ahead of time. Thank you. I will do that. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's one more thing I wanted to tell you about the journey toward what I'm doing today. I started working in a digital agency that I co-founded with a friend of mine here in Atlanta. And we were doing all kinds of firsts, you know, the first prototype of a telecommunications, you know, remote system. I was reminded yesterday by my partner that we had also helped Holiday Inn create the very first website that in the hospitality took business took reservations in real time and a whole bunch of other firsts like that. At the time, we thought we were an agency, but when I look back on it, we really were responsible for more than just dressing up software or telling a, a story like for funding. We were building experiences. I didn't know it at the time. When I went to IBM as their e-visionary, right after that, I found one of the most important professional mentors in my life, Luke Carbone, who ran a company called Experience Engineering. He was really the pioneer of customer experience. A lot of people say they are and they write books, but he actually was doing it for 10 years before anybody wrote a book. So <laughs> I'm a big fan. We worked on the McDonald's account together creating a digital drive through in 1999. It was my, the first project that I had sold for IBM and the first customer experience project I had worked on. And it was amazing to me. He taught me so much about how to think about the journey a customer goes through and how to orchestrate the way a company works to deliver more of what customers want. There's so many experiences in my life today where I have to do all the work. Healthcare and telecommunications are the two biggest, you know, cable and other utility providers come next. But boy, over the years, they just keep doing more and more self-service. And the truth is there is no service in self-service. It might be efficient for some, but if you don't show up as the perfect customer and know what you want, what's available, what to do and how to find it, you're out of luck. So Lou was really sensitive to all of those things. And he also taught me about the value of emotions. When you're doing an experience for people or when you're telling them a story or having a relationship or just hanging out for coffee, there's a lot of transaction stuff that goes on. Some of it's informational, some of it's just human, and some of it is emotional. A lot of it is emotional. And what that means is not just how you feel, but how the other person feels. And experiences are all about orchestrating the clues that a business gives off so that other people can feel not what you want them to, but what 
they want to. That's the magic lesson. And I hope we come back to this again, planting a thought in your interviewer's head, if you don't mind. So you had just started talking about McDonald's. And maybe I can understand a little bit. So you were saying something about how you were helping McDonald's as one of the first digital experiences in drive through Maybe you can help us understand how that would change someone's experience with McDonald's. Okay, so um, in my head, what I see right now are some of the um, anthropological study videos where people would ride in cars with little cameras and they'd go through and they'd have the drive-in exper- drive-through experience. And we'd see from inside the car, but we also saw a camera through the drive-through window. So the person's taking your order and the camera's over their shoulder looking into the car. And oh my God, did we see some nutty stuff. People can't remember their order. They're in all different levels of engagement. Some are drunk and don't don't drink in fast food drive-through. That's not that's not good. Others are like looking through the bags. They get they got the order, but what do they do? They look through the bag. Well we found out that the reason they look through the bag, can you guess what it is? Is because I'm every other time that. they've been, their order's wrong. Okay. And that's so when the order's wrong, they think they're missing something, you know. All right. So let, let's look at it from an experienced designer's perspective or from an operation manager's perspective. They're sitting there going through the food that they already have. And what's happening behind them? People are waiting and getting what emotion? Angry. And what's happening in the kitchen? The hamburgers are burning because everything is done on such a quick cycle at a McDonald's, okay? And the pressure on the employees is rising. So the culture goes down. All of that because somebody's looking through their bag. So why are they looking through their bag? Because previously they got cheese on their hamburger or special sauce was left off that two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun thing. For those of you that don't recognize that, that's a throwback to a commercial that McDonald's ran about the Big Mac a long time ago. So a better customer service, better customer experience means you need really good operations that are set up to deliver that great experience. There are a lot of businesses that say they offer a good experience and they empower their frontline people to make it right. But they don't do anything to support them. That's not a great experience. If you just have somebody who's making too little money and has a big heart trying to fill the gap between what the company is able to do and what the customers want, that's a recipe for burnout. You can't sustain that and it can't be consistent across multiple locations. It just, it doesn't work at scale. So it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot. It's just a stupid thing to do. Anyway, I got a little bit off track here. So back to the McDonald's thing, When you're designing an experience, you want to design both for the problems and for the opportunities. So one of the opportunities in any fast food restaurant is to get more cars to go through the drive-thru at lunchtime. It's the most profitable hour of the day. And as the drive-thru goes, the entire business goes. Bringing that idea to the 2020s, the Chick-fil-A chain of restaurants, which is headquartered in the Atlanta area, has seen almost no drop in sales and sometimes a rise in sales during COVID because they re-engineered their drive through experience and their throughput is absolutely phenomenal. It's even given rise to new like double drive through shotgun style restaurant concepts. Those were pioneered by rallies and checkers and a bunch of others. I remember them from when I was a teenager. But imagine a Chick-fil-A with two complete drive throughs one on each side, the kitchen's optimized to get those orders right in a very small parking lot. So with those long leases they have, they are working super, super smart. Very so impressive So you just operation. put some ease at my personal experience with Chick-fil-A, which is really funny because I am very involved in my neighborhood community. And where I live, lots of growth right? There's just lots of construction, lots of growth. And right on the corner behind me, they're putting in a Chick-fil-A. And I was the president of our neighborhood association at the time that they were coming forward for approval to do this. And, you know, a lot of people, of course, a lot of uh, come to these meetings and they want to know all about what's happening. And, you know, 
it, for anybody that's on the phone that's in a crowded city that doesn't have really great public transport and things like that, like Atlanta is kind of a parking lot, right? Like everybody drives, right? So there's a lot of traffic. And in this corner, it's already really busy, right? And if I could tell you how upset people were, including myself, when we were listening to Chick-fil-A, because they said, well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to put, we want to go on this corner right next to this other fried chicken spot, like literally also that has a drive through And we're going to put two drive throughs right, to get off off of this busy street and go around the back of the building. And it, it's so interesting because you've just educated me and hopefully the other businesses listening today because there was a lot of concern from patrons and from neighbors about how could this possibly be successful for, mm -hmm. you know, for me, right? As yeah. a yeah. potential customer, maybe I don't want to be a customer because they're going to be disrupting my quality of life because I live in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. You know, so it's a really interesting concept because you've just, just, I've taken a personal experience of how am I going to mm -hmm. deal with that? But you yeah. have just confirmed that they've done tons of really great studies on how they can move people through very efficiently to make sure that the people in that drive through are also staying happy. Right. And, and exactly. satisfied. Yeah. And why not give them some money for their college education too? I mean, those are things that just work on so many different levels. It brings in the most qualified students usually, and they don't stay forever, but the, the managers, like the one around the corner from me in the Sprayberry area of um, Marietta, he says two things. He wants the restaurant to be a place that would be safe and fun for his daughter to work, and he's teaching people about leadership. And he opens up all the time with his new recruits and new employees about, you know, what, how does what you're doing right now, cleaning this or serving that or taking this order or cooking something, how does that relate to the rest of life? Now, I'm sure not all Chick-fil-A operators are like him, but he, he adds so much value to the experience. And that makes the employees a lot more pleasant and present. Can I tell you a, a McDonald's story from when I was a, a high schooler? And this is oh, not the McDonald's yes. show, by the way. This is the Cinch podcast. So <laughs> we've got now but, um, our two big fast food names, right? <laughs> right. We'll name drop a couple other things and we'll be all set. <laughs> so I was a high schooler working in a McDonald's and they decided to change out the cash register. So something new and digital. And when I say digital, I mean something like a little bit better than an abacus. Okay. These were antique kind of advanced machines with very small displays. And I was, you know, learning how to enter the order. So I put in, you know, double hamburgers and French fries and a drink. And then there was this other step I had to take before I could get the total and give it to the customer. It, and the, the step was, what's the customer's eye color? And I could pick like green, brown, you know, all these different colors. And the guy who was installing the software system or the hard, the, the cash register system, I didn't even know what software was back then. He said, oh, that's for market research. And, you know, I was just like 16 years old, but I kind of thought to myself, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> What's it really for? I was very bold at the moment when I asked that question. He looked at me with kind of a knowing glance and he said, oh, okay, you can see through that answer. The reason is so that you look at the customers because you're just a high schooler. Uh, so think about that from a customer experience perspective. You're like, you have to like look up. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that engagement is important to the other person. So this brings it all around to what does a customer experience designer do? They think about the interactions and they set everyone up for success. They don't just look at the little path of like getting the transaction done or, you know, buying the doll or buying the clothes and trying them on. They think about everything. How do people feel? What stories are they going to tell? It, it goes way deeper than just the surface. So those experiences really helped. Then I started Story Miners in 2002. So it's 20, almost 21 years old now. Wow, that's great. I didn't know that you guys were around for so long. That's wonderful. It made me think of another question to ask you actually. Oh, uh, go for it. I'm gonna try to answer more quickly now, okay? Yeah, no, this is great. I think, you know, you're kind of proving your, your story because you're explaining to the audience, right, over the podcast that 
how you can really keep in touch, right? And how it really does make a difference. And even, you, you know, you saying about first going digital, right? And asking the eye color. I think they should bring, bring that back because everybody now is in their phone, right? And they are completely disconnected from that personal experience. And it would be cool to figure out how retailers and chains could bring something like that back to get someone to kind of get out of their, you know, space. Because we're doing that all day long, right? Outside of our work, we're doing that all day long. So you probably don't even sometimes realize you're still doing that, even though, you know, you're connecting right here. One of the things I think has happened is that we've become a, a group of people, whether we're customers or employees or strategists and designers, we tend to think about doing things to people. Well, let's make the customer do this. Let's do this piece of software so they will blank, those kinds of things. Ma'am, come over here, you know, instead of doing things for them. When you do things for them, there's a whole different attitude and posture and feeling and grace and harmony that happens. When you do things with people, you have the opportunity to connect, to build relationships, to share, to co-create. When you bring Give me an a example story, of that. Well, let's take the one of, well, you, you just brought up retail and people on their phones all the time, okay? So let's imagine we're at a department store and you're busy on your phone, blah, 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 trying to get your coupons and all that kind of stuff. If the most of the questions that somebody's going to ask probably have to do with availability and why isn't my item the same price as it is on the shelf? You know, because a lot of times things get misdone. So what if we put that control as an option in the app and we let the customers, and I'm just making this up on the fly, so I have no idea if this will yeah. work or not. But if the customer notices that something is out of place, they could just like take a picture. So when they go to the register, they get the item at the proper price and the register operator can push it to another associate who can then move the sign over so they're not losing money on every subsequent sale. So turn the customer into a partner, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, you know, it's really interesting because a lot of businesses, I know that there's a, a nice grocery store where if they do find something like that marked, they don't even charge you. They just put it in the bag right? Like they go and they just sort of move on. Great for me, right? As a consumer, how often is that happening? And how often do they not tell anybody to fix that problem? So how much money could they be losing? So it's exactly. Yeah. It's I was uh, in another drive through and it happened to be another brand's fried chicken restaurant. Okay. We don't do fried too much, but <laughs> I explained to them, you know, they sent me all these emails about getting their app. So I, I get the app on my phone and there's no way to pay them. There's no way to enter a credit card. But the whole app is all about, oh my gosh, you can get this reward and that reward and all this other stuff. So I asked the guy, can you help me do that? He goes, well, I don't know anything about that. And two weeks later, it was the same story. Like now think about that from an employee's perspective. That person, I'm not trying to pick on him or her, I'm not going to say who it is, unaware that they actually have a say in how the business can work, mm -hmm. or they've been told they don't. They're not encouraged to speak up. So there's culture inside that makes a really big difference as well. And we kind of um, do what we're told and we watch other people and kind of follow their lead. So this whole idea of designing experiences and human encounters is really important for how we work because it sets into motion all kinds of really positive things that can happen. At the very beginning of this conversation, we talked about how things happen to you and you have very few choices. We are like a species of Xerox machines. We are very good at copying things that we see. So as a business owner, as an employee, as a designer or strategist, the more good stuff you put in, the more well thought out patterns that actually work that you put into a business, the better that business is going to run, the more friendly the interactions will be, the better your reputation and so on. I feel like I'm teaching yeah. class. Well, just ask me a question. Sorry. <laughs> no, I know it's, it's made me think even of my own experiences, right? With retailers and, you know, to me, a couple stand out, right? Like, 
I love my pets. And I use an online company called Chewy and made the decision to use Chewy. And a lot of people online might know, may or may not know who that is, but they could be considered competitor with all the big box brands and, you know, Amazon and things like that. But it's very geared towards pets. And I'll tell you, they've kept me as a customer because they have always made sure that my experience is personal. They send me a holiday card. They send each of my dogs a birthday card, you know, with a little discount, right? Like, hey, go to this link for a birthday discount on a toy or something like that. Um, And how does that make you feel? I just love that they go to that that degree of paying attention. I want to give them my money, right? I want to stay there. I want to do business with them because I know that they're doing business for me. Whenever something has not worked, you know, they say, you know what? Keep it and take it to a dog shelter and we'll send you the right item. Oh, you that's know? so cool. Yeah. that I love that pattern. That is so nice because then the people in the dog shelter hear about what company funded that extra product that they need. So they have a good feeling about it too. But the transmission came from a human being. Absolutely. Which from an operations management perspective, that's a lot cheaper than putting it in post and then resending it and all that other stuff. So you've kind of become their free employee, but you love doing it. That's a really good design. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they'll, if I ever do call them, I mean, they like they will, will take the time. They're not trying to rush to close the ticket. With, you know, which is a big problem in customer service when you call agents, right? Because they're being watched on how quickly they can solve the ticket. They don't do that there, yeah. right? They ask about what kind of pets you have. What's their name? What are they like? You know, and then they'll follow up with an email for feedback and they'll name your pet or make sure you mm-hmm. send me a picture. I really, really want to see a picture of your pet. So, oh, that's so sweet. It's, yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, it just makes you feel, it just makes you feel sort of important and valued to them, right? So why wouldn't I keep doing business with them? They, you know, they make it easy. Compare that to a big box store. Yeah, exactly. If you compare that to a big box store, I mean, if you have a challenge with an order, you have to go fight at customer service and don't forget your receipt. You know, all those rules that they have in place to protect their financial interests as opposed to promote your emotional well-being. What a difference. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big difference. So, And I know I'm kind of thinking about getting into a little bit of the meat here, right? If you don't mind, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So we're coming out with an industry report around retail and customer experience. And I know that you have so graciously provided some content to our industry report that's coming out. So many retailers use technology to make more sales, cut costs, and improve internal efficiencies. Okay, perfect. A lot of times, the products that make customer experiences better, handheld apps and some of their component parts, shelves that push products forward to you, you know, as you take a bag, it always looks like it's full, all kinds of internal sensors. Um, If you've ever seen the Amazon Go, just walk out technology demonstration store where there's nobody working in the store and they use sensor fusion, which is a combination of, you know, cameras, motion detectors, weight sensors, proximity sensors, the location of your phone and all kinds of things to know what you put in your basket and what you put back on the shelf and then to charge your Amazon card. Very similar. So all these technologies are available. There is so much more tech in the day of a retailer today than there was 10 years ago and probably 100 times more than there was 100 years ago. You can walk in and pay with, you know, 15 forms of payment. You can buy a stick of gum on credit now. It's just there's so much that you can do. So, <laughs> so true. So the, the thing is, though, is that in retail, the predominant mentality amongst most retailers, and I am saying this in public, but I also know it's a generality and it's not completely true. So don't bash me over that. It's been a buy low, sell high kind of a business. Okay. Buy them cheap, sell them, sell them high. And that mentality is the retailer is always trying to improve the spread between the cost of what they buy and the price that they charge customers. So 
with no other instructions, no other new DNA, and no new heart elements, when you put this technology in and you have a lot of choices about how to apply it, like it's about discounts or about personalization or upselling or cross-selling, whatever it is, the mentality amongst people is to basically squeeze as much as they can for the company, and that's the end of the day. Okay. Which means that inadvertently, and these people have good hearts, they're nice people, but inadvertently because they don't study what the effect of their decision is on their customers and on the people who care for them, they end up taking more time of their customers, reducing their choices, cutting the feelings around the product, not letting them have enough flexibility when it comes to time. There's so many elements of that use of technology, like we talked about before, like let the customer take the picture, reward them for doing some of your work, and then have somebody else take care of it. That's a well thought out entire system. But with all these technologies that just take from customers, it's not fair. What, in my opinion, more businesses should do is set aside profit for like five and literally five or 10 seconds to just think about what value can we bring to customers to. They're already in our store or on our app or online with us. What do they need? What are they missing? What would make their life better? And it doesn't have to be something that you sell them. You don't have to limit the thinking to that. You could help them feel like a little lift, you know, like uh, people who shop Patagonia feel really good that they're saving the planet. People who shop at Chewy feel really good about the relationships that they're building and about their pet. They're reinforced as caregivers. They're thoughtful. Yep. They, they value fun. And it's not always about giving the least and taking the least time. It's not about being a, a finely operating machine because we're humans and we're wired differently. We're not wired to optimize everything. So that's the first part of the sentence. What's the next part? So the next part, you said, few of them use technology to use a lens that focuses primarily on customer value creation. So here's the thing about technology. If it's digital, anytime you use it, it has the ability to create a record. It's like an indelible footprint or like a carbon copy of something. So if we're collecting information when they're online and then in the store and then on their phone and through conversation, what if we put all of that together and we were able to meet more of our customers' needs? What value could we create for them? That's that five or 10 second profit pause that everybody needs to ask to find out how can we help our customer do more of what they want the way they want to do it? And that might end up helping you find ways to differentiate your brand, to make it more story worthy, which means it's such a good experience that people can't wait to tell a story about it. Um, those are the, that's the kind of just different thinking that makes all the difference in the world. It's what separates the Chick-fil-A's from the places that you hate to go because they think through those details, there's value in it for the customer. So if you wanna do a little test, we can like try one out if you want. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually thinking about when I get certain promo emails, right? And so often those still, those promo emails will have absolutely nothing to do do with who I am, what I would ever buy, what I'd be interested in. I may have bought something from that retailer before, right? So there's a brand that I really like that's, you know, kind of a lifestyle, sport, athletic brand. Uh huh. And yeah, sometimes yeah. they'll send something to me and I'm like, but you should know that's got nothing, you know, to do with me. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah. but they don't, they don't. right? So, what, so what's the have, fix for that? Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, what would be the fix for something like that? Well, let me think for a second. If I was the person sending that stuff out, the functional employee who has to do that, my incentives are probably to hit a certain amount of new communications, 
create visits to a website, maybe make sales, but there's not always a direct correlation between a promo and a sale. It's, it's not as easy to track as you might think. And I might be trying to get a raise. I might be trying to make bigger decisions at work. I might hate my job too. Those are all the things that go through my head. When I think about being a consumer, I think, oh my gosh, why don't they just mail the stuff right to the recycle department at my local county waste department? You know, I stand by the garbage can and I throw away 90% of the mail. One time in the last five years, I've purchased something because I got a print advertisement on it. One time this year, I bought something because I got one of those trashy email solicitations, but it was something I actually needed. One time out of several thousand. That is the most inefficient way to do marketing in the whole world. I know we're in public. I fundamentally believe that marketing is broken right now. We've got all this technology, but everybody's using it at such a high level. It's the same thing in politics. Too many messages, too much ecosystem, eco chamber, echo chamber is the right word. And it's absolutely nutty. But here's the thing. If you've got a connection with a customer, why don't you replace a push with a pull? Instead of selling and telling, why don't you ask and respond? Sense and respond. Why don't you start a community? Make it more conversational. Make it more about what they need. Anticipate better. Personalize better. But all you have to do, especially if you're a small business, is ask. What are, what are you think your needs will be for the next spring season for your outdoor gear? Like if you're an REI, what are you planning to do? If I clue you in, you don't have to market 90% of the things I don't need. You can give me a few good offers. Your marketing will cost less. Your reputation will go up. Your conversion rates will improve. People will appreciate that there's a relationship going on. If you're doing the car thing, like, you know, we buy, uh, I used to buy only used cars, but then we bought a new car and then replaced it and, and on and on. But like within a month after buying a new car, hi, this is John from the used car department. Hey, I've got a deal for you. If you'll bring in that car that you just got, we've got something great for you. But the first guy was selling me on the longevity of the car. And I got this long-term, you know, um, warranty. You know, so what is going on there? It just doesn't make any sense. I'm just, it just drives, it drives everyone nuts. So marketing is broken. And what's happening, in my opinion, is the middle is getting very, very big. And the people who are using marketing services to sell and the buyers are, are we allowed to say screwed on a podcast? Yeah, they're, they're, (laughs) they're just, their time is getting wasted. It's very similar to the healthcare system that we have with the, the middle, you know, the insurance companies getting ever bigger and their profits are growing, but doctors are getting paid less and patients have less voice and less specific care. You can make all kinds of arguments for both of those industries that, oh yeah, it's more efficient, but it's more efficient for a very few, not for everybody else. So in my opinion, a a, a 10 second exercise that you can do is to think about What does our customer need that they're not getting enough of? That one question. What do our customers need that they're not getting enough of? Now, the trick is that it takes more than 10 seconds because I promise you, you don't know the answer. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to everybody listening. You think you know your customer, but until you talk with them, until you walk in their shoes, until you watch them in your store or watch their behavior online, of course, with their permission, you don't. So you've got to be able to develop the capability, the capacity to find out what they really need. And if you put your lens of, oh, I think they need more bananas in front of them, but they're trying to buy a car, it's just not going to work. And if you're trying to sell something and you're trying to do something to people, you are trying to unload what's on your truck and get them to pull out their wallet and put whatever you've got into their house or their business. That's your premeditated approach. And that is not working anymore. It's also very unenjoyable for everyone in the system. So, which makes a lot of sense because you could literally see how it's happening, right? Um, I was just even thinking about one 
another one where maybe it's just me (laughs) and everyone I go out to dinner with. But the pandemic has changed so much with this, right? So now we're all going back into the restaurants or when we started slowly going back and they were keeping Mm -hmm. us all separate and they didn't want us touching anything. So they, you know, I noticed all the restaurants and the technology came out with, okay, you know what? We're going to give you the ability for you to put your menu online. And then in some cases, we're going to give you the ability where the person's just going to order everything and pay so it's touchless. So no one has to Mm -hmm. touch each other. No one has to touch each other's things. And that's going to be great. And it's going to keep your business alive. Well, that was great. Now that we're all back in the restaurants, right, they have stayed with some of those things. And it has been... And I think some of that is because they couldn't get staff, right? So they needed yeah, absolutely an easier way with a lower amount of staff to operate, right? So now I've seen some good examples of where they use that. But then I'm troubled because I'm like, I'm doing everything self-service on my own. All they're doing now is throwing a plate at me. And oftentimes they're throwing all my plates at me, even though I might have, you know, courses So I'm expected to give more of a tip, right? And I want to give them a tip, but I'm expected to give more of a tip to kind of play into their correct. And what would be a good story to change that to? (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, okay. So you you, you just lit me up here. Um, I I might take this in a little different direction. So please feel free to pull me back, Heather, okay? Um, Okay. The story is always the result of an experience that you have. So if you want people to share a better story, like what you said is like, you know, replace this story of too much technology, not enough service, it's too expensive with a better way to run a restaurant is what you asked me. So mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're in business and you're facing some of these same challenges and it, it can feel like you're in a vice, you know, you've got supply chain and people issues and costs going up and, Finding people through marketing is harder than ever before. It's not easy to be in that situation. But as you're trying to think your way out of it and feel your way out of it, and you start talking to your customers, good for you, you need to envision what that future is going to be like and bring everyone along with your vision. So the way to do that is with a good story. And that was, that's the word that you used, Heather, that got me real excited. Like, you know, what would that better story be? Well, that's up to everybody listening. You can Think of, write down, speak out, record a story of the way you'd like things to work. And you can do it from your perspective, but that's only part of it. You have to do it from your employee's perspective. If you have partners or regulators, you have to do it from their perspective as well. And most importantly, you need to tell the story from the customer's perspective. So if I were to retell that story, I would say, I'm new in town And I'm looking for a place to go eat with my kids and I want it to be easy. I want to know that by the time we get there, we already know that they have something our kids are going to like. And I want it to be fun. I want it to be safe. And I want really good food to come out at the right time so that we can have a family experience. I don't want to be interrupted five times. And one of my favorite things is, Okay, um, your food's not ready yet, but uh, I will be by as soon as it's ready. I'm, I'm constantly checking the kitchen, and um, don't worry, I've got everything under control. It's like these unnecessary conversations that are interrupting sure. what I'm doing. So you imagine what that nicer scenario is like, and then you think about it from finance and food production kitchen perspective and all of that, and you go, boy, if people are going to be checking out the menu online maybe they could create their own menu online. And if they're ready to make a decision, great. We can have the order pending in the kitchen. Or if they just want a few extra ideas, when the server comes, they already know that they're interested in this sauce or that sauce or this for the kids, or can I get applesauce instead of fries or something? So you could marry what goes on online with what happens in the store. Now, this is a very bizarre example, and of course, this use case wouldn't work for everything, but the example here is to look at the behavior that's initiating the whole whole drama, if you will, and seeing if you can get more out of it. So 
I don't know of very many places that let you order online and eat in store. Think about that. That would be better for everyone because if they knew when you were coming, the kitchen could operate more efficiently. You wouldn't take up the table as long. The tips for the waitress would go up. You'd be happier because you don't have to wait unless you like that, you know, let me have 15 cocktails before dinner comes kind of thing. So right. stories are your, your construction paper and your glue and your scissors to let you kind of imagine a future that everybody can benefit from. It's designed for them. It's not done to them. And you get a chance to like look at it in a little laboratory. It's just a story. It's just words and pictures and cutouts and things like that. And then you can find out what people gravitate to. And as you find out what that better experience is, what that better story is, what's, what are the moments that people will be willing to share, then you can start to make it into operations and you get a lot less resistance. That's the key. So one of the reasons people don't change is they fear that change is too hard and they fear that things will be done to them. But when they're part of making the change and everybody loves the story because it unleashes creativity and imagination and when you get to put your fingerprint on it, it feels like it's part of you and you're part of it. Long answer to a short question. Thanks for indulging me. No, that's great. It's actually maybe just think about as you're talking about stories, because this is your wheelhouse, right? So I'm just thinking about a couple of the things that really um, were called out, let's say, on your website and some things that we met, chatted about earlier. It sounds like customer experience design is really designing the story from a business perspective and how you want your consumers to see that story. Well, maybe put. you can. Well put. Is that okay? Am I on the right track? Yeah, no, you, right you, track? yeah, we don't need to define that further. You did a really good job. <laughs> Great so, summary. Yeah, the, the... that's good. So I'm, I'm listening. All right, this is great. It's so valuable. <laughs> and then, then help me understand with, um, and again, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to focus on the last couple of years, but it really has changed, I think, the way business up business operates, right? Um, small businesses and large businesses have really had to pivot. We've seen in the news this week about, you know, projections have completely changed with what Meta thought was going to happen mm -hmm. in the future because of how they had to change things with the pandemic. And they thought, okay, this is here to stay. Yeah, yeah. Oops, mm -hmm. not here to stay. So help me understand what you would do with a, a design and, you know, kind of like help me help the audience really understand a little more about mm -hmm. what it is to design a story for a large, let's say, let's just say e-commerce. Okay. Tell me the tie-in with Meta. You know, the, oh, I was the, just the kind loss of, of 11,000 employees. Yeah. I read the article. It's just so unfortunate, but you know, he, he has Zuckerberg, you know, kind of in an article has sort of owned up to mm -hmm. thinking inaccurately and making a plan okay. for the future that is not really working out to what he thought. And a lot of it had to do with okay. how they market and they use their tools to, you know, for marketing. Yeah. And, um, you know, okay. he, he right. thought everyone was going to continue on this path that they were on in the during the pandemic. And it okay. really hasn't, you know, flushed out quite as well. So... You know, I kind of okay, think about right. he's having to pivot his the story for his yeah. business customers even, right? Okay, so let, let's talk about Meta first and then we'll see if we can extend it to everybody else. Yeah. I'm not an expert on the company, I've never worked yeah, there. I have used an Oculus Quest and played roadblocks and a few, not roadblocks, Roblox and a few things. When I heard that strategy come out of Facebook, I was so excited. I thought that was so cool because somebody needs to make a big enough bet that people can see what's going to be possible for them. I thought a company that could, you know, invest $10 billion a year, whatever it was, could show what are the applications for mental health or in, you know, uh, people who are locked in uh, due to different diseases, uh, improving training, reaching more rural locations. 
speeding the way that people learn, especially when it comes to human factors like negotiations or counseling and facilitation and things like that. These are all areas where a shared uh, physical slash digital presence can really enhance things. I was just amazed, okay? And I, I was really hoping it was going to work. And you know what? It is going to work because those 11,000 people that have been let go are going to go do their own things. They're going to bring the ideas from the big mothership into all these little nooks and crannies. It's going to be a little bit slower, but there's much faster sharing than there's ever been on the planet before for componentry, little bits of code or little pieces of things that when you put them together, give you all sorts of new functionality. So I think the future's bright. I'm very bullish on uh, these, these technologies. It, it is so sad when to feel comfortable, people put a big idea in a box and they say it's either going to work or it's not. And more often than not, they just want to be right at their prediction. That's what so they're tied how, to. It is. You know, it's interesting because you're right. I mean, there's a lot of executives and, and boards, right, of large uh, retail companies, e-commerce companies, you know, and they, they have to be able to project, right? And we all got hit with something that made us all pivot and change the I, way I, I, we... I challenge you on that. They don't have to project. But keep going. Okay. I, I just, I'm calling okay. that out because we're going to come back to that. Okay, keep going. So, you know, again, taking it back to, I'm really just thinking taking it back to your experience and what you do for businesses, right? You know, how does a business decide or how can a business decide whether it's worth building a story and doing some sort of different customer experience? Uh, okay. Design? All right. Cool. All right. right. We're going to skip the project thing. Okay. Okay. A story is the least expensive, fastest, least disruptive, most doable of all the options when it comes to strategy and changing the way you do your business, because it doesn't require a commitment. It doesn't require building software. It doesn't require hiring new people or training them. It doesn't require facilities, furniture, advertising campaigns, anything. It's just sitting around a whiteboard and starting to draw stuff and write it down. It's the cost of this. This is what it costs to prototype your business when you're using story, which is why it's so powerful. It's also powerful because it's infinitely flexible. Let's talk about the three little bears, okay? There was a mama bear, a papa bear, and a baby bear, and there was Goldilocks. Wait a minute, wait a minute, roll that back. There are four bears now. All right, there were four little bears, mama bear, papa bear, and a pair of twins. Wait a minute, we need a dog, okay? And it, it just gets iterated over and over and over, making that practical, turning it into a business. Let's say you've got a very, very small retail store, and you're selling what? How about Chewy goes physical, okay? So what, what goes in a Chewy store? You know, why would you have a Chewy store? What would it look like? How would it work? Well, one story could be is we need to put retail into our marketing mix for Chewy. We need Chewy stores. One story could be let's make them in neighborhoods and let's make them pop-up stores like Halloween or like H&R Block so that once a year, people know that we're going to be somewhere in their area. They can come in, learn about us, work with us. We can get their profile set up, learn about their pets, all that good stuff. And then when we go away, we've still got online delivery. Wait a minute. Here's another story. What if we get some refurbished old uh, mall space? Because there are like 10,000 malls around the country that are changing and morphing into so many different things because our habits have changed. What if we take a medium-sized store it's this big, but we crunch it up to only be that small and we make the last back half of it a delivery and fulfillment center for that area so that we can have sub two hour shipping times. Hmm, that's an interesting story. So you write these different stories up and you use little little things that you have around your desk as people, okay, or you can get some little G.I. Joe characters or army people or powder puff dolls or whatever you like, and you you kind of play the story out and you look at it from different perspectives. What that does is it kindles the imagination of the people on the inside of the firm. Oh, we could also do that. Oh, if we did this, I could bring this old idea that I've had for six months to the table. 
what happens when you use story is the resistance that people normally bring to a conversation tends to fade very quickly because there's always a version that they can see that they're a part of. And when you're building a, a multitude of story, multitude can be two or 10, whatever you need for your business. When you build several versions of this story, something magical happens. They move from, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, to, oh, here's how that can happen. And let me tell you what I think about what I can do to make it work even better. It's so let absolutely me pause for a second. phenomenal. Because I, if I'm listening to the podcast right now and I'm a business, I'm always thinking, how is it going to get me more money? And have you ever had, have you, do you get a little bit of kickback, right? Where people have a hard time understanding the difference of marketing and feel good and a healthy story for their business that would provide value. You know, about 90% of the folks I talk to, I get pushback from. And a lot of them I don't sell to, and I'm sensitive enough now to just not engage further because this technique's not going to work for everybody. Let's go back to that word project. The leaders have to project what their future is going to be. That's a tightly held belief that they have control over the future and that they can make other people do what they want. If that's your belief style, right? please don't call me. We will not enjoy working together. <laughs> In my opinion, perfect, yeah. so much is changing in the world right now. In, in every little machination, our pol political system is changing. Our supply chain is changing. We're moving to a world where supply and demand is going to be much more geographically centralized. You know, the Asian wheat belt, as the ice caps melt, is going to emerge. And there will be a rich amount of grains up in what's now Siberia. I've read, okay? There are changes in the way medicine works. Most of the things that plague us and keep us from doing things that we like aren't going to be around here for our children, at least if things move on their current trajectory. Facts, not fiction. So what do you think then, based off of that, like what do you think matters for companies or what do you think they should matter about? Okay, if there's one thing that people of any size company could do to like, figure out what's next for them, it would probably be to go talk to their customers. The second thing would be to become a customer of their own business. Not schmaltzy like undercover boss, you know, where it's all about, you know, oh, you need, you have such a struggling life. And, uh, you know, and they just, that's just drama for television. Yes, the people are real. The, the good that's done is fabulous. The hope and inspiration is great. The eyes lighting up for the owner so that they behave differently in the future. It's all good. But really, well, no buts. And if you'll go out into the world and see your business the way your customers do, you will automatically get about 75% of what any consultant can tell you all by yourself. It's just not that hard. So you're going to the, the chicken restaurant and your order's wrong again. Make a note of that. You're going to the retailer with a product that you bought online and they won't let you return it in the store. Make a note about that. Chewy sends you that I'm going to, I'm not picking on Chewy, but I'm going to come up with a terrible example. Okay. Imagine, I've never heard this happening, but imagine that Chewy's practice of sending a, a, rem, a very tasteful reminder or a donation or a something to someone whose pets passed away, what if they sent it to somebody whose pet's still living? You've got to take note of that. You've got to, see, I wanted to hit hard, okay? Because I know you're, see, yeah, there, yeah. These are, that feeling that you're having right now is what a lot of people are blind to. They won't see that. You've got to open your heart, got to open your eyes, open your mind. So talk to your customers and shop your business in every single channel if you take fax orders still, fax something in. Find out what happens. Push at it. Test it. Poke it to see how people respond. 75% of it, you'll figure it out yourself really quickly. Now, the next thing you can do to get closer to 100% is to create a customer council. Bring in a few articulate, emotionally mature people who are your customers. 
both fans and kind of close to detractors. You'll need some expert facilitation if you're not a good facilitator, and then let them tell you what's going on. Those are three things that make all the difference in the world. And a lot of our projects at StoryMiners, we start with some variation of those three things. And we let, sometimes we'll bring customers in and we'll let them start telling their stories of the future. And then we turn that into pictures and flowcharts and diagrams and customer journey maps. And we let the, cust- the, the company people look at it and say, could you do this? Could you do that? It's a lot of conversation and socializing. And during that time, What we do is we help everybody see the way the other person sees things because we're not in a business to just take money from our customers' wallets. We're in business to deliver things of value and then keep a little piece of that as our reward. Those things of value don't have to just be dish rags and chewy toys. They can be emotions, they can be memories, they can be meaningful conversations, they can be transformative moments. There's a rich palette of value that any business can deliver its clients, and it doesn't affect the bottom line. So often, it's better to have a great story and share an amazing customer experience and save cost at the same time. But the way you get there is a completely different path through the forest. Which is fascinating because, you know, it kind of like makes me think about how, with all of that, how have you seen things changed over the last few years, let's say? Let's even say five years, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you noticed sort of any kind of trends emerge where businesses, I don't know, I'll just kind of throw this out. Maybe they know they need to change something, right? Because those one-time blasts of a million messages, whether it's email or text now, everything's been moving to text. You know, I like, I, I mean, I... I talk to a lot of our own customers, right? And sometimes they kind of think more is better. Like if I just blast more one-way messages, if I also do it on email, and if I also do the same thing on WhatsApp, then people will finally listen to me. Or if I just blast them to redirect them to their WhatsApp, their, their website, you know, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to be able to then track them because they're going to absolutely click on that link on the text or the email to direct them to our website because we want them to find out more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's, I think they know, okay, that might not be the best thing, but that's all we know. So is there anything that you've noticed emerge in the last few years that you feel you should be helping customers with <laughs> and their customer well, experience? Um, you know, we, we just talked about three different things that people can try. Yeah. That's a really good starting yeah. point because it's really hard to turn a turnip into a tomato. If you think you're a turnip, yeah. There's no way you're going to become a tomato. It just doesn't work that way. But if you see that there can be other things in the garden, and this is getting really Chauncey Gardner here. Um, That's from an old movie called Being There. If you can't see something new and different, you probably won't change, which is why there are so many inspirational books and self-help presentations and all these kinds of things out there. If we look at things structurally, like there's too much marketing on going on, that's kind of a Washington or a Hill, a legislative kind of thing. You know, like, why do I pay money for a phone service and have it interrupt me every night 15 times? Why doesn't my call blocker work? Why why am I, I don't like that. That's not right. See, that's a Washington thing. You know, one of the trends that I've seen, Heather, is that there's a lot more experimentation going on in business. You know, from Chick-fil-A that we talked about before, constantly innovating, to what's happened with movie theaters, shopping centers, uh, apps of all different kinds, check-in services at hospitals, COVID tests at the back of abandoned, you know, um, merged drugstores. There's so much innovation going on. It's absolutely fantastic to see all that's happened. If I could wave my magic wand and ask for one thing, it would be for people's wish to go back to the way things were to disappear. So that they would wish to be part of a future that was more meaningful for everyone. I would switch people from passive recipients to architects. I would help them to unleash their ability to make a difference in the world that they live in. And I'd want them to feel good about trying to do that. So a lot of people are so beat down after COVID or from their life situations that they feel like the world happens to them. 
I want them to feel like the world's happening for them and with them. That's the one thing I would change. And that happens right here in your heart. It happens from your experience and from the things that you choose to do, what you record in your brain as you go through life and what you call back to make your next round of decisions. So I don't think there is a silver bullet or a magic pill that, that folks can take. I, I do think that paying attention to how to create value for others if you're in business is a really good step. It's a different perspective, and it's one that will not be comfortable or easy, but it will not harm or damage. There's only upside in doing that. But as you come to understand your customers more and better, you'll naturally know what they need more of. And you can make decisions about whether we deliver that as a business or not. But your decision will be based on the voice of your customer, not on the loudness of your own wallet. And that's a way to stay in business build a great brand, be referred, and go to bed and sleep well each night. So what I'm hearing is a couple of major takeaways, right? And you talked about uh, listen to your customers, get feedback, be a customer. You also, you've said this throughout the time we've had together today a couple of times. Rethink how people don't want it to be to them. People don't want businesses to be you know, talking or selling to them. They want things to be done for them and with them. And mm -hmm. that's how you create value. And, you know, business should kind of think more about what is the value for others, not always what is the value for my shareholders or my business bottom line, but how can I create yeah. value for what my business is for our customers and others? And then it just falls in line appropriately, right? So did I get that right? Yeah, well put. Well put, okay. well put. In the finance world, they call that part of that summary, shareholder primacy, where it is the duty of the board and the duty of the executives and the duty, duty, duty of everybody to make the shareholders more money. And the corporate board, which is a group of like a thousand of these large companies, realized when they put out a uh, kind of a self-proclaimed new direction for themselves a couple of years ago, that there are other stakeholders like earth, climate, health, you know, people without means, underrepresented populations, you know, people of color, so many different ways. There's so many different constituents that you have to take care of all of them at the same time. There is no they anymore. It's not like they will take care of it. There's only we. And the businesses who think we before me are the ones who are going to be the most meaningful, and in my opinion, be the most sustainable in terms of lasting and being able to continue to create value for their shareholders and their customers and their employees. So, boy, we went all over the place today, didn't we here? You just I like know. wound me up and let it's me just, go. <laughs> it's actually just so interesting because that's a statement that I make, you know, in, in general life, right? You know, let's be more we and not so me. And, um, but it's a really good way to think about it in business terms and how businesses could think more instead of thinking about me and my business. What about we and how do I sustain my business? Well, I do that by really understanding my customer and how can I add on to my business to make my customers even happier, right? Yeah. Do, do um, what creates more value for your customers. That is, that, yeah. that is probably the hardest mindset shift to do. I'll give you an example. I was talking with somebody yesterday about a project that I worked in when I was at IBM, it was for a company called Timken. And Timken is a really well-respected, very innovative rust belt manufacturer. That's what it was 20 years ago. They're in that declining part of the country where everything was mechanical. Well, they've since broken free of all of those, you know, bad names and everything. But they make a tapered roller bearing, among other things. And a tapered roller bearing is like a conical thing. And it lets something very heavy rest on another piece so that it can spin really fast without losing energy. So it's what keeps tractors and locomotives and things like that going. So I was doing a project back at IBM days. This was right after the McDonald's project. And my mentality was, what can we do for the customer? Their mentality at the time, of course, they're very customer centered, but this was the business leaders there. They were all about making more money. So 
one of the things that I learned is that when somebody goes underneath a, a tractor to install the roller bearings, they hold cotter pins in their mouth. Cotter pin is like a two pronged uh, piece of metal that slips through a small hole. Then you fold the ends back. So it keeps the two pieces together, but allows them to twist way too much definition, but they'd go under these things because the cotter pins came with the tapered roller bearings and all of a sudden they drop one. Well, there goes 15 minutes because it took them that long to get the piece, get into position, lift it safely, detach the safety harness, blah, blah, blah. I said, why don't we give them another cotter pin? And the guys looked at me like, what are you crazy? That's 27 cents. Do you know how many cotter pins we'd go through in a year? You know, but then after they kind of got it from the employee's perspective or the installer's perspective, made a difference. So they started packing extra cotter pins. And what would happen is the customers were so happy because the tractors were getting assembled faster. And the value of that was a lot more than the 27 cents for the cotter pin. That's an example. And that's, a, I mean, it's a manufacturing type of an example, right? Like a, a very different, but still extremely relative because you made it more about accuracy, efficiency, which ultimately, you know, time is money, right? And it's both <laughs> ways, right? It's not just for businesses. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. we all as consumers want conveniences and we're all, you know, running around like chickens these days, right? And so time is always money for us. And, you know, sometimes we just don't have the time to devote to certain yeah. things. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap up a little bit more. I want to, you know, before the end of our, our session with our audience, but I wanted to ask you a few quick questions before we end today. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to hear quick answers. I hear you. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to try to, and, and see what, what you come out with. Okay. So okay. if you could give me one word as best as you can, one word to best describe what a customer should feel from a good customer experience? What should they feel? Wow. Every business is different. So there's no formula that would work for everyone. If all ice cream stores only sold vanilla, we would not have as many ice cream stores. At the root of customer satisfaction in any kind of experience is transformation. You Start somebody starts here, they end up there. It's a hero's journey. That's the, there's no simpler format than that. So the one word that I think would be inspirational and something to at least consider would be joy. Because nobody okay. doesn't want that. And it's yeah. a positive emotion. It's not a negative one. And there's so many interpretations of it. And it can come from so many different places and in so many different ways. But joy is something that without saying it out loud all the time is something that we all have a need for more joy. We don't need more consumerism. Some people think you do. Some people think you don't, but more joy, not a bad thing. So that, yeah, that's a great one because if a business is always thinking in their mind, even as the simplest form, how does my customer end with more joy by doing business with me? Right. The yeah, whole thing changes. exactly. Yeah. Very well put. So, all right. So what's the most creative experience using some personalized stories that you can share? What's the most creative one that you've worked on recently? Well, I'm going to share something that's more random that happened just a minute ago. It happened yesterday. I got a, I was trying out a new piece of software that records my Zoom calls and does transcriptions and lets me take notes and cut the little videos up to turn them into things to do. And it stopped working. And I was like, oh. And I thought to myself, oh my God, all right, I've got to figure this out, reinstall this, do that. I've got to look up stuff. I was thinking it was three hours, okay? Five minutes later, I get an email from the vice president of marketing at this company that said, oh, we noticed you were having some trouble connecting. Because you clicked on, you know, share your product, your, share your data with us, we know what operating system you're using. And we happen to know that there's an incompatibility with our software. Would you like us to upgrade you at no charge to the new beta software that we're working on for your new computer? There'll be no charge to you and we can do that in the background. Yes, next call worked. That surprised me. 
that's so that is a perfect positive result an example of using ai and using our data where it's like we're all very afraid of that now right like what are you mm -hmm. gonna do with my data you know what do you mean you're gonna track my data but that's a hugely important reason why sometimes it it is needed because it makes your life easier <laughs> That's that's great. That's super great that they actually were able to do that. And they really did do that with tracking your data and something triggered artificial intelligence for them to ping you on that. That's cool. Which actually probably answers the next question I was going to ask you because my next question was, what surprised you that you didn't expect? So what kind of things have surprised you that you didn't expect from a, a business? I was thinking more in terms of a business there. So, you know, have you ever been like, oh, that I didn't expect that result or I didn't expect this business to want to do this as a part of their story. You know, I'm going to speak to this one in general terms and I'm going to go negative because there yeah. are so many times, yeah. I'm not going to mention any names though. There are so many times when I'm promised this and that's exactly what I don't get. That's a bad surprise. That is what happens a lot more than we know because most customers won't tell you when you're not doing well. They just don't have the time, they don't care, or they think it's embarrassing or whatever. But when you don't keep your promises, it creates this whole domino effect of terribleness. No, that's great. I mean, I think that's so true, right? Um, so that, yeah, that's a good one. Sometimes I think, you know, it is good to talk to, about the negative with these things because if businesses truly do feel like they need to change something and they don't know what to change, sometimes you have to look at the negative things that's happening and face them to figure out how do you improve those things. Right? Oh my gosh, absolutely. You want to look at the good and the bad. Yeah. If you just look for the bad, it brings the morale of the company down. Right. There are every company's doing some good things yeah. or doing some things well, even if they're not the right things. So as a leader, or as a researcher or a designer, or if, if you're the, you know, in charge of the customer experience or the marketing stories, you've just got to be open, be more porous to that so that more good information can get in. When I grew up, there was a story about the emperor who had no clothes and it was a, a silly children's story, but it was all about how people could hoodwink or tease the, the emperor into believing that what he had just paid a lot of money for was absolutely beautiful when in fact, he received nothing. And there are a lot of brands that promise one thing and don't deliver it. And keeping your promises is job number one. That's, I would look at promise integrity as an answer to that question. Promise integrity is what builds, maintains reputations. It's what keeps trust between customers and employees and employees to employees. And it's what generates really good stories. If you build that trust based on keeping promises, you're in good shape. The marketing part is all about knowing what promises to make. Where do your customers need more that they don't have right now? That's your, that's your green field, your white space. That's where you get to create new kinds of value in new ways. And new stories. <laughs> and of course, new stories. Heather, thank you so much. This is amazing. It's such a fun, really a fun interview. Thanks for Oh, like that's stewarding great. the audience's interest so well. Yeah. So let's kind of, I guess it's, you know, time to wrap up. So, you know, I really appreciate you being with us today and spending extra time. And if you could just tell the audience a little bit lastly, before we jump off, um, where could businesses go to learn more about what you provide? Oh, well, thanks. Um, you can Google my name and I hope that somebody will put it right down there. Mike Wittenstein, yep. and my company is called Story Miners, S-T-O-R-Y-M-I-N-E-R-S. -E Just Google either of those things and you'll very quickly find me, a bunch of information, and uh, it costs nothing to have a telephone conversation or a Zoom call to get to know each other. Very happy to help where I can. But remember, if you're one of those folks who already knows everything and isn't interested in change, please don't call. <laughs> Yeah, it's just a lot of effort, right? But I mean, sometimes businesses aren't in the business to do that. I mean, and that's okay. They they might learn eventually, but that's yeah. Well, you know, there uh, I, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but there are a lot of yeah. people who are very good at managing existing operations 
optimizing them, six sigma izing them to the nth degree. I have a little six sigma certification too. So I, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. You've got to pick the right supplier for you that matches your mentality, matches your view of the future, and has the skills to do what you think your business needs. If you think it needs a whack on the side of the head, if you think you want to explore something new and different, if you're trying to figure out what's our new story or the new ways that we're going to create value, that's a great one for story miners. Well, that's great. So, you know, again, I, I really want to appreciate everything that you've shared with our audience and our Thank listeners. You. And Thank you. Thank you. And Cinch thanks you. And I really hope you have a great day. And thanks for the, joining the podcast. Great to meet you, Mike. Be well. Thank you. That's it for this episode of CX Education. Thanks for joining us. This show is brought to you by Cinch, the technology company that helps you create mobile experiences your customers love. Did you enjoy the episode? Then make sure to subscribe to CX Education wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit cinch.com slash podcast to get instant access to all the latest episodes.